here at the beginning of our fine Wednesday morning uh, speech. Ah, yes, and our now web webinar is now streaming live. So anyway, so uh, welcome to the Slavery or Freedom Conference by the National Association of Scholars. I'm David Randall, Director of Research at the National Association of Scholars. And it is my pleasure to introduce for this morning's plenary address, uh, Peter A. Koklanis, Albert Ray Newsom, Distinguished Professor of History at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, who will be speaking on, Did Slavery Make America Rich? Now, I just want to give a bit of Professor Koklanis' uh, CV. Um, he is a economic historian. He works on questions relating broadly to economic development in various parts of the world uh, from the 17th century to the present. He has published widely in US economic history, Southeast Asian economic history, and global economic history, plus a variety of contemporary issues ranging from political economy to culture to sports. And his most recent book, either forthcoming or just out, is Home and the World, Perspectives on the Economic History of the American South. But you know, an extraordinarily rich uh, collection of books, you know, The Plantation Kingdom, The American South and Its Global Commodities, uh, Rice, Global Networks and New Histories, and all the way back to his first published book, The Shadow of a Dream, Economic Life and Death in the South Carolina Low Country, 1670 to 1920. So he is, among other things, extraordinarily qualified to speak on the subject, and we're delighted and proud to be able to present him. Professor Koklanis. Well, thank you very much, David. I appreciate the uh, gracious introduction, and I appreciate the invitation extended by NAS and the uh, great hospitality that you and Chance have uh, offered me over the last few weeks. Let me start my talk with a little uh, contextualizing overture or prelude. Uh, the term polemic is derived from the Greek noun polemos, meaning war, and the Greek adjective polemikos, meaning warlike or hostile. A polemic is conventionally viewed as a contentious, disputative, or combative form of rhetoric, the intent of which is to espouse or support a particular position and in so doing, undermine another. Via bold, categorical, often overstated claims of one type or another, some of the most famous works in Western literature are polemical in nature. Uh, we can think here of Luther's 95 Theses, Swift's Modest Proposal, and Marx's Communist Manifesto. They come to mind very readily in this regard, although it should be noted that some would consider Swift's work rather more of a burlesque or satire than a polemic per se. I don't wish to diminish these above named works by linking them too closely to the 19, 1619 project overseen by Nicole Hannah Jones and underwritten by the New York Times. But in formal terms, 1619 considered in toto is a polemic. The intent of this polemic on one level is to dislodge the standard conventional chronology and narrative scaffolding of US history by elevating the importance of racial slavery and what some would call racial capitalism in explaining both America's past and our predicament today. On another level, somewhat shrouded, 1619 actually attempts uh, to make the case, if not uh, clinch it, for reparations to African-Americans. Reparations do them not only because of slavery, but also because of Jim Crow and decades of state-sponsored discrimination afterward. Indeed, in many ways, 1619 can be seen as an anguished, over-the-top extension and elaboration on Tanahisi Coates's case for reparations, which appeared 
in uh, the Atlantic in 2014. Unfortunately or fortunately, depending on one's priors, 1619 fails as a polemic in my view. Uh, why? To borrow the language of a reviewer for the London Times in 1840, and I quote, it is melancholy to find in this polemic so many words and so few facts, end quote. In the case of 1619, it's accurate facts that are missing. Now, lest I be accused of being ungenerous, let me compliment the New York Times on the graphic design of the August 9, 14th, 2019 issue of its Sunday magazine and for including the usual puzzles and posers in the back, one of which was actually created by Patrick Berry brother of Stephen Berry, a very eminent Southern historian. The rollout of the project was also impressive, particularly in its magnitude. Regarding the content as the great historian of slavery, Eugene Genovese might have put it, cosy cosy, so so at best. The pictures and illustrations work well and the poetry and literary essays are often moving. Some of the essays devoted to historical themes ably summarize and synthesize specialist literature for general audiences. Other essays are curios, at times interesting, but uh, not real consequential. A few are deeply flawed and one is a train wreck. Regarding the essay in the last category, one is reminded of the quote often attributed to Samuel Johnson about a recently read work of prose. Your manuscript is both good and original, but the part that is good is not original and the part that is original is not good. On this more anon, first a few general comments regarding the 1619 project as a whole. To cut to the chase, the principal problems with the most objectionable historical pieces in 1619, and that would be the introductory essay, the framing essay by Hannah Jones and the essay by Matthew Desmond, are linked inextricably to, indeed grow inexorably out of, the motivation for an animating spirit behind the project. Bluntly put, Despite 1619's historical trappings, it is decidedly even aggressively presentist in orientation. The work largely of journalists and engaged scholars, hoping both to help to operationalize New York Times editor Dean Baquette's secret 2019 directive to double down on race with the 2020 election in sight, and as a derivative dividend to provide support for the growing movement for reparations, as Hannah Jones, the major domo of the project has made clear. To me and to other scholars of a non-activist bent, the spirit behind the project is as chilling as it is brazen, suggesting nothing so much as the famous party slogan in Orwell's 1984. That is, who controls the past, controls the future, and who controls the peasant, present controls the past. The same spirit informs the project's research design. This design, not surprisingly, focuses almost solely on one variable, race, under the erroneous assumption that in so doing, the integument shrouding American history will be burst asunder, and I'm using Marxist phraseology intentionally here, puncturing our creation myth and exposing at long last America's seamy underside. Hence the jettisoning of the year 1776 in favor of 1619, a year of little historical moment as I have explained elsewhere, but one it is true in which a small cargo of African indentured servants or slaves was deposited near Port Comfort in the English colony of Virginia. In the modest words of the editor, uh, Hannah Jones, the focus on race in the epiphanous year 1619 will finally allow us, quote, to tell our story truthfully, 
end quote. Really? I think not. For in viewing the complex tapestry of America through one lens and one lens only, that of race, or to be more specific, the racial exploitation of blacks by whites, one misses a lot, even about race, slavery, and exploitation. For example, as Philip D. Morgan's work has demonstrated, there were many more white slaves in Europe in the first half of the 17th century than there were African slaves in Virginia or in English North America as a whole. Morgan, Morgan's findings may not mean much to those involved in the 1619 project, but they are consonant with the rich work of scholars ranging uh, from Orlando Patterson to Thomas Sowell, who have documented the presence of slavery in virtually every society all over the world until relatively recently. Not to mention that of historian Kevin Bales, founder of the NGO Free the Slaves, who argues that there are more slaves living in the world today than there ever were during the heyday even of the Atlantic slave trade. And not to belabor the point, but what about Native American slaves, Native American slaveholders and African-American slaveholders in the US? Regarding the last group, African-American slaveholders, they numbered over 3,700 in 1830. Many to be sure were slaveholders in name only, masters of freed family members in order to keep them in the South, but others were quote unquote enslavers, fair and square, including owners of large numbers of slaves, such as the now famous Ellison family of Sumter County, South Carolina, and John C. Stanley of New Bern in Craven County, North Carolina, who in the 1820s owned three plantations and 163 slaves. Even the slavery portion of the tapestry then is more complicated than the 1619 projectors would have us believe. And slavery constituted just one small part of that tapestry. That's the context then. And again, I'd like to thank Nass, David, and, and Chance for the chance to speak with you all today. This presentation is a very abbreviated uh, kind of talk growing out of a long essay of about uh, 11,000 words, about 40 pages. Slavery figures prominently in a number of essays in 1619 and two, as I uh, suggested earlier, have come under particular fire. The framing essay by Nora Hannah Jones and Matthew Desmond's essay. Uh, my essay and my comments today uh, uh, at this forum are on Desmond's essay. And I call this piece uh, that I wrote and I'm uh, speaking about today, Capitalism, Slavery, and Matthew Desmond's Low Road History. Now, let me talk a little bit about Desmond, uh, his background uh, uh, first, because it's relevant to, uh, as we'll see as we go on. Desmond is a very high profile young professor at Princeton. He's a recipient of a MacArthur Genius Grant awarded as the foundation puts it to creative people committed to building a more just, verdant and green world, or excuse me, peaceful world. In many ways, he's an odd choice for the principal essay on slavery in 1619. For one thing, he's a sociologist rather than a historian. His principal area of specialization is contemporary urban America, writing in particular on such themes as poverty, inequality, housing, social justice, and the like. He runs an eviction lab at Princeton, for example. His first book was an ethnographic study of wildlife firefighters in rural Arizona uh, today. He's best known for his best-selling book, Evicted, which came out in 2016 about the litany of social problems and pathologies associated with eviction in contemporary America. Now, to be fair, he has written on race and race relations, co-authoring two books with his University of Wisconsin dissertation advisor, 
one, a theoretical study trying to lay out a new theory of race, and the other, an undergraduate textbook on race relations called The Racial Order, which is just out in a new edition. In orientation, that text, the authors point out, is uncompromisingly intersectional. But other concerns are more germane to our task today. That text contains a brief section on North American slavery in one chapter. Uh, it's mostly uh, generic garden variety stuff based on secondary sources, but there's one sentence late in that section on slavery, which is telling, where the authors write that, and I quote, American slavery emerged to meet the needs of colonial exploitation and capitalist expansion. So hang on to that uh, because that will be relevant later on. Remember as well that Desmond is not a historian, much less a historian of slavery, much less one who has worked extensively with antebellum sources, much less in archives. Now regarding Desmond, one can't really consider him in depth, however, without saying a few words regarding the new history of American capitalism movement upon whose interpretive foundation his case such as it is rests. Now the new history of American capitalism uh, in kind of uh, in quick form uh, it had its beginnings really in the first decade of the 21st century. It was a product of increased public and scholarly interest in themes such as rising inequality, the 1%, the Great Recession, uh, criticism of globalization, et cetera, et cetera. The new history of American capitalism quickly emerged uh, as a high profile movement renewing interest in economic history, which was a dying field for several decades in both history and economics departments. The main thing it did uh, to renew this interest, I think, is a rebranding exercise in which economic history of the United States was rebranded as the history of capitalism. Its adherents were mostly Ivy Leaguers with associates at other universities, and they mostly have worked thus far on slavery and on America's financial history. If you look at their work, they uh, are not uh, mainstream in the way they do economic history, at least according to the protocols that have developed over the last half century. Ex with a few exceptions, they are fundamentally enumerate they have little familiarity, at least explicitly, with economic theory or formal methods, and are interested in other topics and themes than our most mainstream economic historians. Their main beliefs, and this is important because they inform Desmond's essay, are that one, capitalism is inherently bad. It had illiberal rather than liberal origins based from the get-go really on power, compulsion, and exploitation. In America, capitalism arrived early based on slavery, which was and is the foundation of America's development and its wealth today. Particularly in the 19th century, it was important to America's growth and development with the rise of the cotton economy, which was not only in their view, the principal source of America's development in the 19th century, but is closely connected to the later history of capitalist development in America, which in their view has always been based on exploitation and expropriation, albeit taking different forms and expressions. The stars of this movement uh, are people like Sven Beckert at Harvard, Ed Baptist at Cornell, Walter Johnson, who technically does not consider himself part of the movement, but travels in the same circles. He's also at Harvard, Calvin Schermerhorn at Arizona State, Caitlin Rosenthal at uh, Berkeley, and Lewis Hyman at Cornell. 
Now, Desmond takes the new history of American capitalism, Bataan, and runs with it, combining, in my view, in a very Procrustean way, the two main themes of the new history of American capitalism, slavery and financial history, arguing, in fact, that slavery led directly to financialization in the US today, not merely to greater inequality, the rise of the 1%, neoliberal policies, deregulation, the Great Recession, et cetera, et cetera, but directly even to people like Pharma Bro, Martin Scarelli, and it's with Scarelli uh, that Desmond leads off his article. For Desmond, the link between all these things, and particularly the link uh, connecting slavery and financialization, derives from a uh, formulation developed by one of his ex-professors at Wisconsin, the sociologist Joel Rogers. And his, this concept uh, of Rogers is called low road capitalism which Desmond says was pioneered by Southern planters in the antebellum period. When a capitalist society goes low, Desmond claims, and here's a quote, wages are depressed as businesses compete over the price, not the quality of goods. So-called unskilled workers are typically incentivized through punishments, not through promotions. Inequality reigns and poverty spreads, end quote. The burden of the argument in my piece is that what Desmond's essay amounts to really is low road history. Let me stress again that Desmond has no background studying slavery or the antebellum South, so that he relies almost exclusively on new historians of American capitalism uh, scholars despite the battering that they have taken from professional economic historians, virtually none of whom buy most of their arguments, particularly their attempts at using numbers, which is the stock and trade of modern economic historians in modern economic history. Um, now here's Desmond South and the role they're in before I go through these points seriatim and try to debunk them. According to Desmond and slavers, and that is the preferred uh, coinage of the new historians of American capitalism, and slavers and their enablers in finance and banking created a South dominated and informed by large modern capitalistic quote unquote slave labor camps, that is to say farm units and plantations. Enslavers worked their slaves mercilessly and brutally to produce cotton for export in a system whose low gear was torture. Uh, that phrase comes from Ed Baptist. Cotton for export built the US economy in the antebellum period and set the tone for America's low road capitalism ever since. The enslavers were modern in their calibrated use of coercion and in their fixation with proto-scientific management and accounting. But their maniacal greed and low road brutality rendered the antebellum Southern economy highly speculative and unstable, subject to periodic but predictable panics and busts, such as the panic of 1837, which they see, Desmond sees as analogous to the Great Recession. And these busts were caused by the depredations of rapaciously speculative Southern capitalist planters and their collaborators in commerce and banking. That's the argument as laid out by uh, Desmond in his modification and adaption, adaptation of the new history of American capitalism position. Now, Economic historians and uh, mainstream historians working in other fields of American history have been quick to criticize much of the, this, this position that has been articulated in books and articles by new historians of American capitalism. Um, 
In the case of slavery and the economics of slavery, none of these critiques has been more comprehensive or effective than that done by two very distinguished economic historians of agriculture, Alan Olmsted of Cal Davis and Paul Rohde of the University of Michigan, who have basically punctured the entire argument raised by the new historians of American capitalism and taken uh, on by Desmond regarding the economics of slavery, the causes of rising productivity in cotton, which was in Olmsted and Rohde's view, not torture, but innovations in organization, machinery, and particularly biology, the introduction of a new uh, strain of cotton, which allowed for higher yields and higher picking rates. They have uh, challenged effectively the role of cotton in the US economy, uh, which they see as vastly overstated by the new historians of capitalism and Desmond and on the importance of slavery for US development as a whole, which they also see as vastly overstated. Now in my paper, I summarize and elaborate upon some of these points, uh, giving proper credit to those who have in fact developed these critiques, but I focus more on Desmond's attempt to link slavery and financialization, uh, which is the most Procrustean part of this entire argument. That is to say, I look very closely at the link that Desmond sees between Southern plantation management, finance and banking practices, and neoliberalism and financialization, which he sees as the dominant themes of America over the past 20, 30 years and uh, hurting the American uh, economy and most of its population significantly. Like the rest of Desmond's work, it is based almost entirely, this critique is uh, of American, uh, of, of slavery and the low road. His position is based almost entirely on work done by the new historians of American capitalism, particularly one edited volume uh, put out uh, by uh, people associated with the movement, a book called Slavery's Capitalism, edited by Sven Beckert and, and uh, Seth Rockman of Brown University in 2016. In this collection, Desmond borrows and elaborates upon the work of four or five scholars, Bonnie Martin, Ed Baptist, the aforementioned Calvin uh, Skirmerhorn, Josh Rothman, and Caitlin Rosenthal. And the components of his allegations uh, are as follows, and I try to lay these out and uh, dismantle them in my piece. Desmond emphasizes, among other things, the fact that slaves were mortgaged in the antebellum period and they were used as collateral for securing debts, which he seems to think is a huge research find, which leads linearly to financialization today, the low road capitalism. No economic historian worth his or her salt would be surprised by this finding. What is so surprising uh, that slaves constituted a significant uh, class of collateral in the antebellum period? They were, a they were a legal class of property in 1860 comprising 45 to 50% of Southern wealth. Why should this form of wealth not be used as collateral? Collateral, to be good collateral, needs to retain value. It needs to be easy to liquidate. And it has to be relatively fungible. And slaves were, just like land, livestock, tools, household goods, stock certificates, life insurance policies, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there's nothing real surprising about that. Secondly, Desmond in this section makes a very big case on the use of debt instruments in the slave economy, particularly bills of exchange and the existence of credit relationships across international boundaries, which he sees as somehow uniquely pernicious 
and unique to the slave economy. Nothing the South did in terms of debt instruments or transatlantic credit transactions, networks, or financial innovation, however, was unique to the South, much less pioneered in it. Such uh, instruments as bills of credit, bills of exchange, paper money, practices of discounting bills of exchange, commercial banks, life insurance, credit reporting, et cetera, et cetera, were all developed earlier and in more sophisticated ways in the North than in the South, if anyone had bothered to look. A third point is the emphasis that Desmond makes on speculation. He somehow thinks that Southerners were uniquely prone to specialization. Uh, tulip bubbles, anyone? And that Southerners were unique in their speculatory abandon. I believe that such views are way off base. Panics have proven intermittent occurrences in capitalist economies, not constitutive of them. Moreover, Desmond, following Josh Rothman's work, doesn't really understand or appreciate the real economic function of speculation and speculators. Speculators are not good or bad, but efficient or inefficient. The economic role of a speculator is at once to absorb excess risk and to provide liquidity when necessary. They help to render more efficient, basically, the intertemporal distribution of resources under conditions of uncertainty. No one knows what the future will hold, and speculators are taking a risk in holding and distributing resources over time. They are part of an investment constellation that includes hedgers, arbitragers, and normal investors, and each in a functioning financial market performs a discrete function. Another part of the argument laid out by Desmond uh, has it that Southern enslavers practice scientific management assiduously on their factories in the fields and in their uh, accounting practices, you can see this. Enslavers are accused of intensely systematic organizational behavior, including precociously calculated accounting methods, which included depreciation of their slave assets. Close analysis of the evidence in this regard uh, doesn't support this, however, and it's widely exaggerated. The account books that have been looked at uh, quite closely by a number of scholars, Rody, Olmsted, a young scholar named Ian Beamish, have shown conclusively that there was little system order and regulation really in the way Southern planters did their accounts and very few, if any, real attempts at anything like uh, cost, ac uh, uh, cost accounting and uh, depreciation. Now the real South, in my view, is very different from the South laid out in Desmond's essay, economically. While I uh, would agree that it is a capitalist system, Slavery was important in it, but it must be contextualized. And in just the remainder of my comments today, let me just summarize a little bit and then I'll stop and answer questions, how I see the real economy developing. I believe, and again, this is not something that not everyone believes, but and I go through the reasons for this in the paper, I believe that the South can be considered a capitalistic economy, not only in the antebellum period, but even earlier uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the 18th century, really. And I use this label despite the fact that slaves were prominent in parts of the South early on, in the Chesapeake colonies, the Lower South, uh, and in the British West Indies, if you want to include those in British America at this time. So the conjunction of slavery and capitalism works for me but a good bit earlier than it really does for uh, the new historians of capitalism and Desmond. 
if the forced link, however, between antebellum slavery and financialization is spurious, what can we legitimately say about slavery's role in the antebellum South, and indeed in antebellum US more generally? I think we could say quite a bit. Uh, just in terms of numbers, however, keep in mind that only about a quarter of the 25% of the free families in the antebellum South held slaves. And the modal number of slaves held was one. Uh, that is to say the number coming up most amongst those who held slaves. Uh, only about out of the one quarter of the slave holding families in the South in the 1850s, only about one out of 12 would be uh, constitute, could we call planters? That is about 3% of, of free families in the South would be considered planter families under the most common definition, 20 or more slaves. If you use another definition, that is to say 20 or more working hands, that number is even uh, smaller. Now, secondly, I would stress with William Freeling, Lacey Ford and others that there was no one South, but really many Souths in the antebellum period. Uh, some of which slavery was an unimportant and in other parts by 1860, it was dying out. I would also point out that some leading experts, including Philip Curtin, uh, one of the most eminent uh, writers on slavery and the slave trade, felt slavery was insufficiently important in North America as to include the South in either edition of his classic rise and fall of the plantation complex. In Curtin's view, the South was a society with slaves rather than a slave society. Now, after offering Curtin's viewpoint, I would be quick to add that I don't buy the argument about the South. I believe that the region, uh, despite the small percentage of planters, should be considered a slave society controlled by planters and their associates in commerce and finance uh, because power cannot be reduced in my view to numbers and percentages alone. Moreover, I would go on to argue that despite the fact that the South had slaves, it should not be considered uh, pre-capitalist in any way. Uh, the presence of slavery should not be viewed as evidence that the South was pre-capitalist because this institution, like the second serfdom in Eastern Europe at about the same time, should be seen as an expression of an emerging capitalism related to the discrete labor conditions and needs in certain areas. The same liberal dimensions of early capitalism that led to freer and freer labor forms in some areas led elsewhere in some cases, in parts of British America in the early modern period, especially the West Indies, the Chesapeake and South Carolina and Georgia. In these areas, the market-driven desire by Europeans and European Americans to organize and sustain production of staple crops for export, sugar, tobacco, rice, and indigo, this was before cotton, led them in many, if not most cases, to favor enslaved African-American and African laborers. Why? For several reasons. It was difficult in the Western hemisphere, which was land abundant and labor scarce, to secure free labor and retain it in place, particularly for onerous jobs in unhealthy climates. After numerous trials and experiments with other groups, European and European American agricultural entrepreneurs and their commercial allies found that Africans and African American laborers constituted the best fit for their labor needs. Africans were in many cases already familiar with routinized agricultural labor, and in some cases may have possessed proprietary knowledge regarding agriculture uh, and certain crops, particularly rice. They had some natural and inherited immunities to certain mosquito-borne diseases that killed other laborers in higher proportions, and they were considered by Europeans and Euro-Americans others ethnically, racially, religiously, culturally, and as such were assumed to possess fewer natural rights, privileges, and immunities than those uh, that needed to be respect respected uh, than other groups did. 
Slavery, however immoral from our point of view, was thus seen as the labor form that made the most economic sense in some areas, provided that the supply of African slaves was sufficient to meet labor needs and that the prices were reasonable. For the most part, these requirements were met. Note, though, that the prices of slaves, generally speaking, were not low, but relatively high. Uh, that's one of the problems with the, the new historian of capitalism line. Acquiring and deploying slaves was not mainly a decision made because of low cost, but based as Gavin Wright, among others, has shown on the bundle of property rights related to slavery which allowed those that owned slaves to position them wherever they wanted to, even in unhealthy places, work them hard and long, even mercilessly, and retain them and their progeny as long as desired. These rights did not obtain to anywhere near the same degree with other labor forms uh, and thus the emergence of slavery in certain areas. I can go on to argue in the piece, and I, uh, I'll end uh, in a minute here, that slavery was vital to the South growth beginning in the late 17th century, not in 1619, not in 1650 or even 1660, but in the last quarter of the 17th century and remained so until the time of the Civil War. Slaves were deployed throughout the economy in that 170 year period or so, but were especially important as agricultural laborers producing subsistence crops as well as staples for export. The most important of these staples in the antebellum period was cotton, but remember that corn rather than cotton was the most important Southern crop in terms of value. And that cotton, the leading export in the United States by far, nonetheless, comprised a very small proportion of GDP, usually around five or 6%. Now the new historian of American capitalism view and Desmond's view uh, is that cotton totally dominated the US economy in the antebellum period, comprising as much as 40 or even 40% 40 or even more of the US economy. And this is grossly exaggerated based largely on Ed Baptist's unfamiliarity with national income accounting protocols, particularly with how GDP is constructed. Such unfil unfamiliarity led Baptist to double and sometimes triple the size of the cotton economy by adding to the value of cotton production, the value of all inputs used in its production, when according to national income accounting protocols, those inputs are already subsumed into the sale price of cotton. This is a big measurement error, but one that has not been admitted by Baptists and has gone unremarked upon by new historians of American capitalism who continue to use and stand by Baptist figures despite their repudiation by measurement uh, experts. Just to close a few last points on the Southern economy, in relative terms, the Southern economy performed well in many ways in the antebellum period. And if severed from the US and considered a standalone economy, the South was one of the wealthier parts of the world in 1860. The region's wealth was based largely on agriculture, particularly upon that the part of the sector deploying slave labor to produce staples for export. The region's manufacturing sector was not inconsequential, however, particularly for the age, but the South was clearly not urbanizing or industrializing at nearly the rate of the North, preferring to pursue policies predicated on the continued push westward of the cotton economy. And so doing expanding, as Drew McCoy put it long ago, uh, expanding across space rather than through time. The planners, merchants, bankers, and politicians who led this push westward were more or less forward looking and modern in their thinking, but they hardly represented the capitalist vanguard in the Western world. And their work sites, the plantations were not factories uh, in the fields. Now, if mean income and wealth in the, of the free population 
was relatively high and grew, the region was also home to many poor people, uh, uh, not only the slaves, but also uh, some of the free people. With this point in mind, the last point I'll, I'll cover basically is who benefited from slavery? Not the slaves, obviously, and much of the free population in the region probably didn't gain much either, although some certainly uh, uh, did even if they weren't slaveholders through the economic links and connections with the slave labor-based ag economy. The region as a region, this is a difficult question to answer because the trajectory of the Southern economy was disrupted then irrevocably changed with the Civil War. But I have argued at length elsewhere, along with many other scholars, that while the Southern economy was growing in the antebellum period, the growth path taken was not necessarily conducive to long-term development. Like other plantation economies around the world, that of the South was unbalanced and overly specialized, marked by relatively low levels of urbanization, particularly in the interior. It had a rudimentary conveyor belt transport system uh, designed to facilitate exports and imports rather than knit the region together economically and very low levels of investment in human capital. Few plantation economies anywhere in the world have ever developed into modern high performance economies and none based on slave labor have. And numerous studies have demonstrated the long-term negative effects of plantation based slavery on those parts of the South where it took firm hold. So slavery or slavery's capitalism almost certainly did not promote the economic well-being of the region over the long run. Uh, that much is clear. Consumers, however, of agricultural products produced by Southern slaves likely paid a bit less, whether in the South, the North, or Europe, than they would have had said products been produced by free labor. And merchants, bankers, and manufacturers within and without the region benefited in various ways from their involvement as well. Although assessing the degree to which these individuals and firms benefited is difficult because little is yet known regarding the opportunity costs they would have incurred by foregoing investment in the slave economy. One thing is clear, however, that the US economy, unlike the Southern economy, was not based on slavery in the 19th century. Although cotton produced in the South was important early on to the textile industry in New England, in the larger scheme of things, the most important economic developments of the century, urbanization and industrialization in the Northeastern quadrant of the United States, and the creation of the dynamic agro-industrial complex of the Midwest owed relatively little to slavery. Cotton, one recalls, could be produced with free labor, it was much more important in the South after the Civil War and emancipation and demise of slavery than it ever was before the war. Production doesn't peak until the 20s and cotton's importance to the American textile industry followed the same pattern. Indeed, it is more accurate to say that slavery distorted rather than directed capitalist development in America. Slavery constituted, constituted an illiberal expression of early capitalism in certain contexts in labor scarce land abundant areas during the so-called primitive accumulation or early capitalism. The principal thrust, however, of capitalism was liberal and progressive, resulting in greater economic freedom the forces unleashed by capitalism that brought slavery to British America and sustained slavery for a period thereafter later led to the rise among some and then among many of what Thomas Haskell has famously called the humanitarian sensibility that led Great Britain and the US to abolish slavery relatively early in the modern period, far earlier than it in many other parts of the world, especially in Africa and the Middle East. Slavery in the American South was an abomination, but Matthew Desmond taking his cues from the new historians of American capitalism, grossly misrepresented it in order to render financialization of the US economy its lineal descendant. Clearly Desmond would do well to look elsewhere for the roots of financialization, 
and to who or what begat Martin Scarelli. Uh, thank you. And and thank you so much. Um, I'm getting my video on. Uh, the wonderful speech. Um, wonderful to hear it. And I am going to start passing on some questions and uh, with some of my own put in. Um, one question which I'm just going to sort of add to, you know, a, you know, question, I have a grandchild who's starting school this year. Will she learn the story of slavery in the United States through the lens of 1619? Um, I, I, I want to sort of push that actually to a sort of a question of teaching. Um, that is not just what they, the, the, your, their, the grandchild will learn, but you know, how they should be learning it. You're giving a wonderful um, stuff that college students should know, but in fact, there's the question, what should they have learned in high school to prepare them for this? And then I suppose, you, you know, history and economics. And then I suppose the question is, you presumably also then teach this yourself at the introductory level at college. How do you teach this? And I suppose I'd even push that to students who are hostile to learning this interpretation to begin with. Yeah, those are uh, tough questions, especially for the right out of the gate. But uh, I think, uh, history is complex. It's uh, tragedy, not melodrama. And I think that what we need to talk about it, when we talk about slavery is uh, placing it in the context of an entire un, uh, unfolding of an American narrative, which uh, I believe was liberal from the start. It's not perfect. It has gone on. Slavery is a blemish on our history, but it is not all of our history. And certainly uh, one always has to ask the question or, or frame the question uh, when looking at American history as compared to what and compared to what other areas do uh, does American history uh, get uh, judged. I believe that the main thrust of American development from the get-go was liberal. And slavery, like the second serfdom in Eastern Europe, arose for a particular set of conditions for a period of time. But ultimately, the forces related to private property, economic freedom, and competition, that is to say capitalism, unleashed in the American nation, forces that overthrew the slave regime and continued the American uh, progressive experiment over time. There's no need to whitewash slavery or pretend it didn't exist, but by overstating it so drastically as the people in the 1619 project do, and their zeal to make it the only criterion upon which to look at American history, I think one does uh, severe uh, damage to the uh, historical record. There are many good liberal historians who uh, have studied slavery and can teach it very uh, effectively without overstating uh, either uh, its importance, its uh, legacy, uh, and uh, its embraceness in the American uh, past. Uh, most of the economic historians who have been quite critical of uh, the new historians of American capitalism and Desmond's piece are uh, Democrats, I would say, uh, in, uh, politically. They're not uh, what would be considered by some of their uh, opponents, uh, you know, people who uh, are uh, revanchists or uh, coming, uh, coming at things from a, you know, a, a, a very, atavistic perspective. 
So I think it can be taught and it has been taught quite well. One thing about the, the way economic history and uh, its findings can improve is the way we disseminate and talk about the information for general publics and general audiences. One of the things that the new historians of American capitalism do quite well is write. They're good writers. They communicate what I find are flawed findings, but they do so uh, effectively. And that's one reason I think uh, for their purchase. There's a math barrier that many Americans uh, can't overcome in, in trying to deal with a modern economic history. And I think that economic historians in both econ and history departments uh, would do well to try to render their findings more uh, understandable to general publics and also to work a little bit more harmoniously together. Uh, economists who study economic history and work in it and historians who work in economic history are sometimes at loggerheads because of a uh, little bit differences in uh, the way they frame questions, uh, uh, the use of modeling, the use of inductive or deductive reasoning, things like that. I have a, so I've got a related question. In effect, how a source for people to pass on what you're saying, the correct history of the ec uh, economics of American slavery. Um, is there you know, a single or a few books or articles you would recommend? And I must say, if, if your own article is about to be forthcoming and published, that would be wonderful <laughs> to know too. Well, there are some good historiographic uh, works that uh, and reference books that uh, cover a lot of this stuff. I remember, I mean, not necessarily my uh, touting my own, but there's a, uh, there are a couple of reference works on slavery, uh, one by Oxford University Press put out a number of years ago and a more recent four volume history uh, by Cambridge University Press uh, in which they have lots of different essays on uh, various aspects of slavery and emancipation. Uh, for the Oxford, uh, volume, which uh, was edited by uh, Mark Smith and by uh, B uh, Bob Paquette, who will be speaking tomorrow. I wrote an essay, for example, on the economics of slavery. It's a synthetic essay, you know, based on the work of many fine economic historians. And uh, for the world uh, history of slavery that Cambridge put out in four volumes, edited by Stan Angerman, David Altus, uh, Seymour Drescher, very eminent figures in the, hist in the literature on slavery and emancipation. I wrote a piece on emancipation and its aftermath. So I, uh, in both of those, I, I try to kind of summarize and synthesize the literature, but these volumes are, are contain a, a wealth of information on all aspects of slavery. Uh, very good historians like Mark Smith and Peter Colchin, uh, and Peter Parrish have written syntheses of slavery and the economics of slavery as well. And they, they can be uh, seen as quite uh, uh, useful. One of the problems with the economic literature of slavery is that much of it appears in uh, journal form. And there are often, uh, uh, there's a, a bit of math involved in some of the work because some of the questions uh, are framed in ways that you wanna really uh, test them uh, and try to falsify them if you can, the questions you are raising. So uh, I, I would look to the syntheses and these reference works for a good quick uh, take on it. The economic history uh, community has a, a, a net presence and there is a, a kind of encyclopedia on what's known as EH net that has very good pieces, very up to date by some of the major figures in economic history who have studied slavery closely. Nifty, thank you. I have a sort of a question which is following up actually from some of the previous sessions where in the political realm, you know, th there's the recommendation, you know, go back to the original sources, read, you know, the, you know, the debates of the founding, um, you know, for the, to understand what was going on in the minds of the people doing the convention. 
can one and should one do that for economic history? Are there people who understood accurately what was happening in the economy at the time, or reasonably accurately, or is this all something where in effect it's, you know, assembled later by economic historians? Yeah, those are very good points. And these are, are, are points that uh, economic historians often uh, need to wrestle with. Uh, no one in the South in 1860 knew the inequality coefficient of, uh, you know, for white Southerners or something like that. Uh, however, uh, there are lots of sources available on the first question and, and a number of people have put these together in very usable ways so that people can get a good broad view a profile of the Southern economy from data sets that have been assembled that are widely available to the, the public now. Uh, there's a big, big sample that many people have used of the cotton economy in the South uh, in 1860. Uh, Paul Rohde and Alan Olmsted have done this methodical comb through the cotton economy and have done an amazingly complete work uh, using archival uh, account books and all kinds of plantation day books and record books, and they uh, continue to publish uh, their findings. The point you raised, though, about uh, what was known at the time, I remember in his presidential address in to the, maybe in 1982 to the American Historical Association, Bernard Balin uh, made a, a distinction between uh, basically facts that are patent that everyone knows and so-called latent facts or, or, or things that we only know uh, later or people only are dimly aware of at the time. And one has to kind of keep that in mind uh, uh, when trying to uh, account for historical causation and, and, and things like that. And economic historians don't always do that uh, when they you know, come up with a finding based on uh, research done a century and a half later that shows that uh, maybe uh, more people should have revolted uh, in the revolution because of the inequality at the time of the revolution or uh, the Southern economy uh, was going to be hurt uh, by the Civil War because the, the GDP was so, uh, uh, per capita was so high before the war or whatever. But you have to make this distinction, I think, between what was known generally at the time and what can be unearthed and teased out much later uh, by uh, assiduous research by Beaver and scholars. Mm. I, another follow-up question then, how much do students, and I guess actually professors also, need to know about what it's like to work on a farm, you know, whether free or slave? That is, I, I, it seems to me that there must be vanishingly few people now who, who know what it's like to work on a cotton plantation period. And I, I suspect the number of people who simply work on a farm period, your students, it must be getting to be smaller and smaller each year. How much do, do you need to teach that? And I'm gonna say practically, how much do you have to teach that to your, your students, your colleagues? How much should that be part of you know, the history for high school students? It's, uh, it's very important uh, you know, today, uh, about 1% of the American labor force is involved in, in agriculture and the levels of intermediation between food production and consumers and college students is so great, even in areas, even in ag schools now, most of the people coming into ag schools and studying agriculture may not be from farm backgrounds anymore. I did a, uh, a visit a couple of years ago to a, uh, an agricultural high school in the middle of Chicago uh, where people are learning agribusiness, but they never set foot on a farm prior to uh, you know, an internship during the summer. But this is very important. The, and one of the uh, uh, real problems, I think, in understanding slavery and agriculture is that it is so far removed from the daily experience in most parts of the world. In 2007, more than half of the world's population was quote unquote urban. Uh, 
for the first time, which uh, is kind of suggestive of what's happening. And I think agriculture as a whole is becoming harder and harder to, uh, to fathom for many of our, our students. And I think a real effort has to be made early on to try to get people to establish a kind of empathy and an understanding, a sympathetic uh, look at the problems of agriculture, what it means to be uh, living on a farm. Agricultural historians have, uh, and the field of agricultural history in recent decades has, has, has undergone a renaissance because there have been a couple of new movements that have come into it. The history of food is becoming quite popular amongst uh, uh, urban middle class and suburbanites. And so they are kind of going uh, vertically integrating backward into agriculture and, and starting to kind of study agriculture a bit. And environmental history, which is a popular field, uh, uh, has its uh, uh, students who are interested in agriculture. So I think that if you kind of frame agriculture a little bit more broadly and look at the it, uh, part of a, as, as part of a food system and an environmental uh, system, then I think you can uh, arouse more interest in, in studying agriculture, agricultural history, including uh, that part of it, which uh, occurred in the South before 1860. So shifting from agriculture to a different thing, it seems to me that part of what the 1619 project is assuming is some sort of tight connection between American economics and American culture as a whole. You know, that in fact, it's a slave, it's a slave economic system and therefore a slave culture, which becomes a racist culture and so forth. And I guess, I mean, this is, does lead to the sort of the interesting question, how do you think of the term, the relationship of economics to culture, I guess, broadly for history period, but you know, for the American South, and in fact, how much is a pre-existing, you know, Anglo-American culture forming the slave system, how much is the slave economic system then reaching out and reshaping the culture? And I get, I, I'm asking this because I do think this speaks more broadly to the 1619 project and its assumptions. Yeah, I think uh, certainly that it's not an old uh, base superstructure model in which the economic system is informing everything else. They are uh, they go back and forth, I think, and there's a lot of uh, arrows pointing in each direction in terms of the relationship between culture and economics, not only in the South, but in other parts of the United States as well uh, in the past. I would argue that uh, the South, by and large, during the period under uh, in which slavery uh, was uh, part of the, the Southern economy, I believe that most Southerners partook, generally speaking, in the same uh, basically liberal capitalist culture that the rest of the United States did. Maybe not to as advanced degree, but a number of intellectual historians over the last few decades who have written about Southerners have seen them very much in the mainstream of Western culture in the 19th century. The South, uh, where it was once considered uh, you know, backward and closed to the Western tradition is now seen as very much part, uh, part and parcel of that tradition, partaking in the same debates in the antebellum period as their Northern colleagues. Some have argued like Michael O'Brien, David Mulkey Hansen, that they were as well-versed in romanticism as, uh, the New Englanders in the 1840s and 50s, but were probably closer to the root of the things because they were uh, very much attuned to German culture and French culture and, and British culture, as well as what was happening uh, uh, in stateside. So I believe that uh, it is erroneous to reduce Southern society and culture to slavery uh, in, in the antebellum period, much less in the 18th century or even going back to Port Comfort in 1619. Uh, many people have pointed out the religious uh, 
the power of our religious ideas in uh, early America and in shaping our culture and our, our uh, traditions, as well as the Lockean ideas that we uh, that many people have emphasized. So I think it is a very complex, intricate, interbraided tapestry that we're talking about. And one of the the real problems I think with 1619 is its attempt to reduce the entire manifold American experience to uh, race, slavery, racial exploitation from the get-go. Yeah, thank you. I have a question from an audience member. How is it that historians have lost the plot on this subject? Uh, of slavery or? Well, uh, uh, I'm American history, economic history, yeah, how is it that the 1619, you know, narrative uh, has captured, you know, the professional historical imagination? Oh, well, I wouldn't say it has captured it entirely. Uh, it's, it's, uh, there are many historians who uh, are sympathetic to the present situation in the United States and are trying to find, I think, uh, uh, historical connections to help to explain it to them in terms of race and disparities. Uh, and many uh, see a plausible link between the early beginnings when most Africans in the, and African Americans were in fact enslaved in the United States and the present uh, differentials in uh, uh, social stratification in the United States. The problem I think is that uh, the economic historians have not uh, weighed in uh, in a systematic way on a big enough platform uh, with enough amplification to really uh, get, get their views disseminated widely, not only in the historical community, uh, much less the general public. Economic history is a very small field, both in economics and in history departments, and it was almost dying in both until the last decade or so when the new historians of American capitalism uh, appealing to the uh, people who felt estranged from opposed to the current uh, form, at least, of capitalism in the United States, I think found some historical uh, grist uh, to, uh, in, in, in their explanation of our past. Uh, I think Economic historians can do more, I think, to render their, their technical work more accessible to a broader audience. And they would be doing us all a favor uh, if they did so. Because, I mean, one of the things I, I mentioned, like many of the spurious conclusions and findings and uh, quote unquote facts disseminated by the new historians of American capitalism and used by Desmond in his piece have been systematically repudiated and refuted in the specialist literature, but it hasn't uh, gained ground with others. Now, it might be intentionally so, but uh, in part it's because uh, it can be difficult to read uh, economic history literature because of uh, it, it involves some times some uh, experience with numbers, with formal, uh, formal methods and with statistics, things like that. But I think we can all, uh, we would all do well, I think, to try to find ways to disseminate more accurate uh, portrayal of, of the Southern economy. And it's not by any means uh, uh, trying to uh, kind of, say that the you know slavery was not horrible immoral uh, and often very brutal but it was other things as well and uh, on a day-to-day -day level uh, there were uh, often uh, nuances that are lost in an economy 
uh, in a depiction of the economy in which torture is an everyday occurrence used by uh, uh, merciless enslavers to ratchet up productivity on a daily basis. So it's mainly overstatement, I think, uh, that over time in the 1619 project leads to a, a massive misrepresentation of the economics of slavery. Thank you. I, I want to say one thing is, could links to articles on this subject be sent to us? Uh, we could then spread it on social media and educate many more. That's one thing from the audience. I, I'm going to say, if you would be so kind as to send me a, a brief list of you know, things people should read, oh, I can, uh, that would be wonderful. And we could then add that and put that, you know, say, add that to the web page. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that, that I think should be uh, on the uh, to-do list. I, I'm going to frame um, a, a slightly different question. And again, this is getting back to the teaching of it. Let's say that you're teaching a course on American economic history, and you have a five sessions, an intensive week or two, on American history from, say, the invention of the cotton gin to the outbreak of the Civil War how many of those sessions, those five sessions, would you devote to, you know, Southern economic history, slave history, and, you know, and the interrelations of slavery with, you know, the North? How much would you devote to other aspects of American economic history? Yes, I would, uh, and I have, uh, say, with only five or six sessions on that whole period, I would devote one probably on slavery or comparative northern southern uh, economic trajectories in the 19th century. I would certainly begin that whole, uh, this whole enterprise with a very close look at the Constitution, uh, which basically anyone who's interested in America's development, particularly its capitalist development, should uh, read very closely because I think most economic historians in recent decades have, regardless of the period in which they work or the geographic area, have stressed the importance of laws and institutions in framing uh, the possibilities of growth and development or impeding those possibilities. So I would start with a good close look at the constitution and our <clears throat> Uh, system of, of institutions. I would look at uh, what we came out of in the colonial period, uh, you know, what, what, what was our starting point. I would look at some of the, uh, I would spend some time on the early developments in transportation, uh, in business organization. Uh, demographic developments are quite important, especially spread over space. I would look at that. And then I would uh, basically try to fit in the South's developmental pattern as part of a national uh, economic development experience. The South shared many things with other uh, regions in the United States uh, in the first half of the 19th century. Transport improvements, infrastructure improvements, the beginnings of manufacturing, uh, urban developments, uh, immigration, lots of uh, different uh, components of uh, the economy or economic factors affected North and South alike. Uh, uh, and it's, uh, it's somewhat skewed just to focus on, on slavery as uh, the only uh, thing to talk about when you're looking at, at uh, the South. I did a paper a few years ago, for example, in which I, in which I uh, looked at uh, innovation and patenting in the South in the, in the antebellum period. And while it isn't New England in many ways, there are parts of the South that had significant uh, uh, traditions of innovation. And I looked in particular at South Carolina and compared it to a couple of other places. And the South is, is not, I mean, it's, it's an outlier in some ways, but not in all ways. I'm going to ask a question about which is uh, a slightly different essay in the 1619 project. And I know this isn't quite your specialty, but I thought I might try to put it in. Uh, the Frontier. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the essays was in effect saying that slavery was vitally important for the American frontier, you know, its expansion. And, you know, 
the economics of slavery. Um, would you be willing to speak on that particular essay's take on the frontier and then how, what was, do you think, the, the role of slavery in the expansion of the frontier? Well, I think it is important because of the, uh, the mindset of uh, Southern planners in the 19th century, where it made a lot more sense rather than to try to constantly improve land with the price of land very cheap for a variety of reasons, including pushing out Native Americans in part. Uh, there was a, a drive westward and actually eastward in some cases to fill in parts of the South that had been passed over, particularly Florida in the 1850s. But uh, frontier expansion is important. And that's uh, Tyra Mills's, uh, Miles's article, I guess, that you're referring to. But one has to keep in mind that even in 1860, 85% of the cotton produced in the South is produced uh, east of the Mississippi. And it, most of it is still in, uh, not in Texas, which, which is focus uh, of that piece. Texas develops in the 1850s and its cotton uh, frontier develops much uh, in, in the late 19th century and in the 20th century when Western Texas and then Arizona uh, become great cotton areas, but not in the, uh, it's, it's not uh, nearly as important in the antebellum period. But I think there is a drive westward and there's just as there was uh, in the North during the same period. It's interesting after the Civil War, many of the, uh, one of the most uh, dynamic Southern agricultural export industries, uh, rice, was reinvented uh, by Northerners who came South and reinvented the rice industry of the South in Southwestern Louisiana, Southeastern Texas and East Central um, Arkansas. But these were Northerners come South for the most part. Uh, uh, so they were developing uh, new frontiers in areas of the South that had not uh, yet developed. Thank you. And let's see, a another question from the audience, you know, why is it not pointed out that the North was directly benefiting from slavery as they were buying raw materials harvested with slaves? And I just sort of want to increase that question to be, how should one teach the Northern economy's dependence on slavery? You know, the scope, the methods, the, the, the importance. Well, I, uh, I wouldn't necessarily say dependence on slavery. It's, uh, it's an integrated economy and, and Northerners were certainly involved in the slave economy. There's no question about that. We've known that for a long time. Uh, people who have studied particularly areas like New York City, uh, where, which was very, uh, uh, very much uh, connected to the South's economy in the 1840s and 1850s. Uh, to say that an area is connected to uh, uh, the slave economy doesn't mean it's necessarily dependent upon it. Uh, the North was either the Northeast was dependent on the Midwest as well uh, by the middle of the 19th century. This, uh, there was a lot of, uh, this was a, one of the great uh, virtues of the article one of the constitution was to create a, a free trade zone within the United States, which made it the biggest free trade zone in the world at the time. And there were people and goods transacting back and forth uh, in, in, in this period. And the interconnections of North and South are not to be denied, but uh, it's one thing to, uh, to say that they are connected and another to say, you know, to say that the, the North was dependent on uh, uh, American cotton. This, uh, the New England textile industry was a relatively small component of America's uh, economy in, in 1860 as well. Hmm. Which given how much it, we focus on New England, uh, you know, factories and textiles, that, that's a fascinating uh, thing to realize. Um, the biggest source. Uh, oh, go ahead. No, no, you, you first, please. Well, I, I was just going to say one of the, in terms of capital formation in the United States in 1860, the biggest 
component of it, either first or second, was land clearing, not factory factory building or anything like that. It was the clearing of land that added to the value of land that formed the biggest or second biggest, it depends on how you measure it, a component of our whole capital formation uh, process in the 19th century. All, uh, America was still only 20% uh, of the United States was as a whole was urban in 1860. Uh, most people were farmers north and south. The key really, I would argue, was not the connection between the north and the south for America's development in the, in the middle of the 19th century, but the intricate interlaced development of farm and city in the Midwest, the creation of this agro-industrial economy, which began to interact very closely and over time to build significant wealth up, a strong, rich, dynamic agricultural sector that interacted with the cities and then became a great export, export uh, fact, uh, uh, center as well in the late 19th century, leading to the so-called wheat invasion of Europe by Midwestern farmers. And it was this, this form of agriculture uh, that was uh, for the times relatively high tech, capital intensive, uh, scientific methods that was really, I think, uh, the normative kind of uh, experience. The South's agricultural sector became retrograde in the late 19th century, backward, low technology, low wage, low skill, uh, low productivity, while the North went in an entirely different direction. And it was largely, I think, because of the close connections between agriculture and industry. Cyrus Hall McCormick, remember, started out in Virginia, moved then to Cincinnati and then to Chicago, where uh, the McCormick Reaper Works International Harvester later became uh, a great interface between farm and factory, city and rural. Hmm. Thank you. Um, we're getting near to the end. I could ask you another question, but I, do you feel comfortable at this point in wanting to make any sort of closing remarks? Would you like to hear at least another one more question as we approach 1230? Um, I can, I, you can do another question. I, 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 the, I, the paper is a little bit more systematic than the, the remarks today. And I think a lot of the, uh, I was leaving a lot of the evidence that I had adduced and putting together the argument out. But I, but I think uh, the problem I think with the, Desmond's essay is that it was, is its present orientation and his attempt to look back from his own area of expertise, the financialization of the American economy and what he sees as a low road form of capitalism today and try it, to tie it to this project, which I think uh, doesn't work very well. It would be much, much easier to connect financialization if one wanted to with developments in the Northeast in the 19th century. There's another guy who's kind of a very able scholar who's kind of affiliated with the new historians of American capitalism named Richard White, who has written very powerful, well-researched books on the creation of the railroads industry in the 19th century. And if one wants to look at financial chicanery and all kinds of low road capitalist developments, most of which were not in the South, but with the New York Central and the Pennsylvania Railroad, one can just as easily and probably more accurately go there than look to the South for the uh, uh, creation of a person like uh, Martin Scarelli and uh, Turing Drug Company. Hey. Should I ask, is your essay already planned for publication somewhere? Uh, no, I, I kind of wrote it with this conference in mind. So I don't, I didn't know what, you know, I, I still have to finish the notes out of it, but uh, it's- Well, I, I, well I'm going to say then, if you, we, we might actually then, if, if we 
might be fun if and when you finish it is to see if we could have a chance to put it uh, you know up on the web if you're willing to do that i you can say no later at your leisure i just <laughs> i'm just putting this out yeah. now that i mean I, I do think the people here would all be fascinated to have the chance to see the full argument yeah i think uh, i think and economic historians do that all the time they uh they often put up working papers on either a website in order to solicit feedback. It's a very welcoming community, even though economists have the reputation often of being barracudas and very uh, 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 forceful at argumentation and brutal. They actually, it is a pretty uh, welcoming community in terms of criticism and people uh, put up their stuff and circulate it widely in order to get closer to an accurate uh, representation of the past. Well, so yes, well, either, as I say, we would be, we would love to put it up, you know, in association with our web pages here and, or if you put it up elsewhere, we'd be glad to do a link to it. And I think okay. everybody would be very happy to see the full argument, uh, you know, which, and in fact, I mean, and since a large part of this is what are the counter arguments one should have to the 1619 for the public, it would be useful not just for scholars, but I think for people just wanting to show it to their local school boards and say, hey, look at this. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, I think anything that we can do to try to promote a little bit more balance in our representation of uh, the, our, our early history would be uh, welcome. Lovely. All right, well, I'm going to say, well, I'm going to say thank you so much. I'm going to give a quick shout out that our next panel discussion is at 2 p.m., Teaching American History, uh, moderated Tom Lindsay with Richard Johnson, Robert Maranto, and Jamie Gass. And having done the, the, the publication uh, publicity for that, again, thank you so much for this really wonderful speech. Oh, well, thank talk. you. Uh, let me thank the audience for... Uh bearing with the technology and uh, the transformation of, the, of a live conference into a zoom an hour or whatever we are doing. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Thank you. I'd have, have a lovely day. You too. Thank you all. Bye now.